Jan's toolbox includes standards and practices such as IT for IT, ITIL, SAFE, design thinking, agile, DevOps, and continuous delivery. And Jan is, thank you, Jan, you are an active member of the Open Group's IT for IT forum. In this session, um, Jan will present a case study for how, for how Skyhoof's partner set out to modernize its operating model to better support digital product delivery. The initial phase of this product, uh, of this operating model modernization initiative used the IT for IT reference architecture as a blueprint for a holistic capability model for the IT organization. So we've heard a few uh, standards from the open group mentioned uh, so far today, and Jan's going to uh, talk to more about uh, another one, the uh, IT for IT reference ar architecture. So uh, a warm virtual welcome from the open group, um, Jan Stober. Thank you, Steve. I am, uh, my name is Jan Stober. I'm working for a CQB's partner. I, I guess that's the most um, diff difficult thing of this presentation to pronounce the name of the company. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> we are, uh, um, I've, uh, actually, I've been working for a project uh, in the last couple of months, almost all a year now, um, that is, uh, that is an operating model uh, modernization project, and that's basically the um, the topic of my talk today. Um, I will start off um, with um, a short introduction of uh, Suki's partner, or who we are, and what we do. Um, then I will uh, describe our modernization voyage, uh, and before I really deep dive deep dive deep into our operating model transformation. I will not be able to be talking about all of it, but I will. Uh, I want to look at two aspects that I think are especially interesting um, before we then go over to uh, the Q&A. Um, Sugu's partner is a, a part of the uh, Southeastern Norway Regional Health Authority, or Norwegian Hesesseres Regional Hesesseres. We cover about 3 million citizens. That is over half of Norway. Um, um, we have 11 local health trusts. I look at them as a federation, but they're actually owned by HSRS um, and a few private partners. Uh, physically, that's 25 hospitals, thousands of ambulances, pharmacies, labs, logistics, and a lot of health care centers. Um, there's 80,000 employees in HSRS. That means we have 80,000 users. And um, uh, in 2019, um, uh, has rest spent about uh, um, about eight billion euros, um, um, mostly for IT. <laughs> and and so um and uh, not, last but not least, has rest has Norway's largest IT environment, and uh, there is where Sukus Partner comes into play. We're one of those eleven health trusts, and um, we are the shared service provider, founded in two thousand three, basically by. Um, putting together all the IT organizations of those uh, hospitals. We have uh, grown to uh, 1,550 employees, um, a number that has, is still growing, but has become quite stable. Um, short about Sigis Partners motivation, Modernization Voyage. In 2015, um, we thought we started for the first time to uh, make an, a large modernization of the infrastructure estate that at the time had grown old and was very fragmented. Uh, and the uh, discussion phase in the, in the ended up that we uh, started uh, basically a sale and lease back um, outsourcer uh, where a partner would take over uh, responsibility for the infrastructure, modernize it and we'd be and deliver it back to us. Uh, one of these spaces. Um, um, weeks before uh, we should go live, uh, the, uh, the uh, project was uh, stopped due to security concerns, and one year later, was uh, the uh, contract with the outsourcing provider was cancelled. Um, then the same year, we started a new program for the standardization and modernization of the IT infrastructure. Um, um, the two programs have in common that they're mainly technology focused, um, but especially the, the newer one has uh, in, uh, actually a bigger focus on um, on the operating model and actually acknowledges that when you modernize infrastructure, you also have to look at your operating model. Um, 
I'm mentioning that first program really because um, it is important to understand what such a project or program gone wrong does to your employees. Um, uh, we are meeting a lot of resistance in that new project just because it, you guys failed the first time and everything went wrong the first time. So although everybody agrees that we need to do something, we need to transform, everybody still has that, feels that pain from that um, first attempt on sour um, and that, that uh, impacts the new work. But why transform the operating model and why transform it now? Um, we are seeing that we have a growing backlog of deliverables to our customers. We have uh, an end of life um, issues in our technology estate. Everything grows old. Just as a reminder that uh, since we attempt, we, sh we wanted to source out the infrastructure, not much has been done there in the last previous, in the last years. Um, we have this modernization um, initiative ongoing. And the region is building several new hospitals, almost in one hospital per year. And we have that ever ongoing digital transformation throughout the healthcare region that just leads to an ever increasing demand for IT capacity and, and velocity. Um, so we are, um, our approach is that we have to automate what we can automate in order to make room and have the, and use our people um, to focus on what cannot be automated. Um, so we think that we need to adopt modern practices and behaviors. Uh, we have to go over from, from a waterfall, throwing things over the fence approach to project delivery, to establishing teams uh, that maintains and has a much uh, a bigger ownership to uh, the technology. We need to collaborate more and more efficiently. Uh, I think a lot often we use the term co-creation instead of delivering. Um, and like I said, we need to seek automation and, and to make to make root capacity free for um, other stuff and also to reduce errors. Um, so what are the ingredients for an operating model? Um, we have, in the last six, seven years that I was with Circus Partner, we've worked with service orientation and we basically started wrapping our, the applications that we maintain or deliver to the hospitals into like a service wrapping. Uh, so I think, so the other things that are, uh, that we thought should go into uh, an operating model of uh, our design thinking at Agile DevOps and continuous delivery, delivery as the four cornerstones uh, that we build everything on. And as I pointed out earlier, we think that a hierarchical uh, organization um, uh, that is very focused on the managers and the leaders um, is not efficient um, to, uh, uh, for what we need to do. We want to have more end-to-end -end accountability, accountable teams where throwing over the fence doesn't happen anymore, but really where you have a team uh, with an accountable accountability for what they deliver. Uh, at a previous open group event a couple of years ago, I picked up this book here, and um, it's uh, it's called The Operating Model Canvas. And uh, uh, what's nice about it is this picture. It's so self-explanatory. Um, and so it divides up your operating model, it tells you, okay, what are the domains uh, that you have to um, look at when look, working with the operating model. And so defining an operating model, that, that it, it's two things. It's how we deliver value to our customers and how we run ourselves. Um, and that helps us to, uh, to, um, to uh, structure our approach and our, to do what we do in this project. Um, so what to do first? Uh, we figured this is this is so big and 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 large project you tend to fail and because we need we we tend to fix everything, um, so we need a map and a plan. Uh, and scope is really the biggest issue that we've experienced all over the years. And the bigger the project gets, the more likely it is to fail. So fix everything project are too large and they're difficult to manage and they will fail eventually. Small isolated initiatives have little or no business impact. So you have this, these little heroes um, that I 
have much respect for, but they go and fix one process. And then you say, oh, what's the business impact? None. Because what you do is right, but it depends on other things happening in order to have an effect on the business. And that's where we struggle also with idle processes that we have established everywhere, basically, in, in operations at least. Um, so if you want to improve one, you end up having so many dependencies that your project gets large and, it, it, and you have to stop or scale down, um, or you have to basically make the project larger and larger with, which, with, with all the difficulty that brings along. Um, and then, um, and whenever we work with process improvement, we figured out, we saw that there was, there was, the effect was so little, and then we couldn't show for what we did. We, internally, everybody was said, oh, cool, yeah, now you'll have a change process improvement, or you have request models. But it, it doesn't really it didn't really feel at the at the at the, at the business end, um, and all obviously especially from the vendor market, uh, I guess it says okay we need to build buy a new tool set we need to transition to another tools and everything will be will be perfect and that's obviously not true either. So what are the main building blocks? And I'm now going into um, into that policy into the into the canvas uh, and the, in the the P in the middle which stands for processes. Um, we uh, decided that uh, we need to describe the enterprise at rest and the enterprise in motion. Um, for rest, we use the capability uh, object uh, from the uh, Archimate uh, specification or standard. Um, um, that would, and capabilities provide high-level view of the abilities of an organization. So, what can, what do we do? What does the and, and for us. Focusing on the IT part of the organization. Okay, what is the IT, what are the IT capabilities? Um, and on the other hand, the enterprise in motion. How do we actually generate the value? Um, and and how and, and we need to describe that on a high level and not to basically dig into too long details and actually have to, to formulate something, to a proposal that that the um, the business would buy into. And so we use the value stream object in uh, in Archimate. So um, the first thing that we uh, we said we needed was a capability model, and here we um, we were really compensating for our governance for the lack of governance. I think uh, so. I was when I started in that project, I went to our governance people and said, "Okay, where's our capability model?" And it wasn't we didn't have one, right? So um, so we said, "Okay, let's use IT for IT, which is really um, a reference architecture for tooling." Um, but it has all the ingredients that you need for a capability model on the business level as well. Um, so we, uh, at the time, uh, version 2.1 was the current version, which still is, I think. Um, you had those four value streams, strategy portfolio requirements to deploy, request to fulfill, and detect to correct. And we uh, made those capabilities. Um, and uh, that w basically worked quite well together also with, uh, with the discussions we are having in the IT, IT for IT forum every Wednesday. And um, so we built this picture um, basically I, based on um, something I found in the forum. Uh, and we called it Circus Partner Value Network. And then we made all the value streams capabilities and we tried to find stuff that are, that are uh, in those capabilities and so we could have basically have a a hierarchy also in the capabilities. I have to mention that we got a lot of help from our um, from uh, from from the market here, so that's not necessarily know how that we had in house. Um, based on that capability model, we defined value streams, and those are again very similar to what you are going to experience in the next version of IT for IT. I think. Um, so we will have this this the value stream explorer that basically is about making good plans. Uh, you have an, a value stream of, for integrate, which is basically building good products. You have a, you have release. Um, we are not calling it release, not publish. And that basically is all about building that IKEA catalog uh, that you can publish to your users and say, okay, this is what you can order. Um, um, you have request basically in where that that describes what happens when someone orders and deploy. Uh, obviously, what happens in the systems and operators all about um, uh, secure uh, operation of things. Um, as it, also, if you rem remember that 
that big arrow from version 2.1, what's under the arrow has become those supporting capabilities. We really need those. They're not only supporting, they are part of the operating model. So a um, little, um, if we move this around a little bit and move the strategy portfolio to the top, then you get this picture. And then we've, at the, we tried this, we tested this. <laughs> so I could say we we're agile um, and then we got quite good feedback. Um, um, also, just um, this is one way of using those pictures. We highlighted those that we focus on. So it's not that we don't have the other ones, but we're just in our project, we're actually working on with three of them. So again, back to scope and or to them, we have um, adopted a model uh, that we said, okay, we need to develop the values to maturity um, in stages or in plateaus, if you want. And you can only integrate what you know, you can only automate or integrate what's integrated. So we really say on that, this is a communication effort we, that we're doing towards leadership and also inside the organization, we start simple. We need to understand and really write down how we do things. When we really have agreed here and we're 1500 people, so that agreement and in Norway takes a long time. Um, um, so and once we have those defined, we next actually build and screwing together the systems and building the integrations between systems to later on then automate it then. I think there are no shortcuts here, so you can hop over things. You can start with automation without being uh, truthful to your stakeholders and say, okay, and there's an automation unless we have this figured out. Um, so what to do? Uh, we built, uh, we call this a sunshine diagram, although the sun is green on this one. Um, uh, we have a, a, a stream, basically, if each value stream gets one of those sections in that diagram, we put all the efforts and all the initiatives that we, um, um, that we plan, we put on this picture. And this, is, this worked out to be quite uh, useful when communicating what we're attempting to do. And the other thing is we can actually say, okay, we're only going to focus on this box. And uh, when we're finished with that box, and uh, we're going to take the next one. And you can say stop. Um, so we don't need funding for this whole picture. We need for this little box right here. And, um, and that reduces risk and actually increases the, uh, the focus on, on, uh, on the work at hand. Um, now I'm going over to use the last few minutes to looking at organization or the organization dimension of the, of the canvas. Um, we have uh, a current pattern that business teams and project talk directly to infrastructure teams. They do not speak the same language. They, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of misprioritization between operations and development, obviously. And, and the worst thing is, I think, that you get a lot of undesired variation. So uh, whenever we, uh, we build something, a system, uh, then they basically the infrastructure beneath gets set up is, especially for dedicated for that system. And, um, and so everything is different. There's no standard components. There's, a, there's that language gap between the people. The, every, there's a lot of technology depth. Um, and, and, it, and it's difficult to set up con, uh, integrations between the system afterwards. Uh, none that, and last but not least, you're, you're getting really dependent upon your vendors uh, for all those uh, clinical systems. So what we are thinking is uh, that we need to um, build up uh, a framework for co-creation with uh, business teams on the top and infrastructure teams at the bottom as before, but we have in inject those platform teams in, in the middle that understand the business team language, but that can say, okay, and here's your menu. Uh, here's the stuff that you can consume to, to, um, to build your business services on. Uh, and that, um, that standardization. Um, and uh, I, we have this ESM orchestration team and for service management um, orchestration team on the left that is, um, that is creating, that is maintaining the framework. We do, we're quite specific about in our communication internally that this team is not about controlling the deliveries and the thing and what happens between those um, those teams, but basically to build the outer bounds uh, and the and the framework of communication between those teams. 
Um, so um, that uh, will narrow the language gap. We will have uh, a decoupling that makes it easier to lifecycle the, uh, the, 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 the systems on uh, the specific level also. Um, in practice, this could look like you have a, you have a systems, a portfolio of systems on the top or services or digital products or whatever you want to call those that we can pick and choose on what platforms they're on and the platforms themselves can pick and choose what infra infrastructure they're on. Or picking and choosing is maybe not the right term, but there's a little more flexibility here. And also we are having, uh, we're building up a structure that actually allows us to manage the the variety of technologies on both the infrastructure and the platform level. Those teams, um, we're, uh, being, um, we're looking at those two pizza team rules that there have, don't, that shouldn't be um, too large. And I also recommend team topologies, the book, um, which is very interesting and gives uh, some hints about um, how to build those teams. Um, I would like to close with some lessons that we have identified but yet not solved. Um, we find that uh, value streams help to create focus on one area at a time. So that's really built much more than processes. And um, they're useful for understanding tooling, the flow of information, um, and tooling integration gaps, and to develop tooling strategies. Um, but not only that. Um, um, the IT reference, IT for IT reference architecture, um, we find is finally accepted as a standard in-house. And we originally pitch it as a standard that we just have to be basically comply to when we do things. We have a challenge that um, the things we do uh, tend to be very academic. Um, it's hard to get approach for an for an EA approach uh, that is not uh, fighting fires. Um, um, we need to compensate for a lot of stuff that's missing in governance. Like I said, the capability model is really not something that I personally think uh, such a project should produce. Um, and uh, I think being bold is also uh, very difficult, uh, especially when using terms as DevOps and and uh, and those other pillars that I was uh, that I mentioned at the beginning create a lot of uh, defensive reactions saying we're not doing this kind of stuff. This is uh, like ten years in the future. Um, uh, what we've learned so far is, and then I uh, need to mention that we are now at the end of the concept phase, so we're trying to get in the planning and the, and the implementation phase afterwards, um, is that you need to start, we need to gain momentum. Uh, there is a, we found out that we, uh, that by starting one of those um, uh, initiatives that I had on that sunshine map, you, you instantly get the buy-in of that stakeholder and that he will help you, he will carry your, this project into the next phase, and then trust will uh, build up. Um, we need that iterative uh, approach is, uh, is very important, but you still have to have a, a constant work with the, on the plan that evolves over, t over time. Uh, especially in a project as, well, that is part of, it, of a uh, infrastructure modernization program, you, you need to be very specific about that Operating model transformation is not technology transformation. It is organizational development or organizational transformation. It is not, uh, those soft things are not so easy described as building a data center or, or replacing network switches. Um, and uh, so it's, it's more difficult to get buy-in for those. Um, we have a, a established the habit of insisting on the accountability of um, both other project and the line organizations for what we do. So when we're building catalogs, for example, uh, for in, in, uh, and, and or building um, processes, then we're not starting before we don't have this um, this crown prince in the organization that will own this afterwards. Um, and last but not least, you need to make sure everybody understands what you're trying to do. In some phases. Some aspects of this project, we uh, honestly we couldn't explain it, and that was due to the reason that we didn't understand it ourselves. And so um, that was. Um, but once you can explain it uh, to to everyone, uh, then uh, then I think it's it, it gets more obvious uh, what you want to do, and and I think then you will succeed. Yes, uh, I think this was it. Um, thank you for your attention, and um, um, I would then, if there's time left, see if we could uh, do some questions. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jan, for uh, for, for your presentation. And uh, yeah, we're, we are uh, 
extending people's uh, um, participation here a little, but a um, uh, question uh, came in that uh, actually came in in a different uh, a different uh, context earlier around the uh, agile architecture sessions, and that was um, with such a with such a transformation like this that doesn't just a, it's not just a technology thing. It's it's you know it's affecting people, processes, culture. It's 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 a big deal. How do you go about that whilst continuing to do business as usual, to do the day job, to deliver the the services to clients as usual? I think there's two questions here. I think Ben gave the one, one part of the answer uh, by uh, actually um, breaking it down and running your um, TOGAF ADM cycles uh, incomplete, you could say. Um, and the other one is, uh, like I said, finding that crown prince in the organization, solving actually a current pain point for someone and, right. and basically adding, uh, like pinning to it, all the other small stuff that you really want to do. So right. we, uh, we, we uh, as, for us, standardization is that big issue. And then, so how, so the question is, how do, can we standardize? How can we standardize? Um, how can we reduce the, 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 the variation? And then we said, okay, do it this way. And, um, and I think that, that, that's, that at least that's our approach and we're going quite well so far. Yeah, no, absolutely, and it's uh, it's it's great to hear a, a, a story of um, of how useful standards can be um, as well, because obviously this is the open group, and that's that's what we do. So uh, um, thank you for uh, thank you for sharing the experience. I'll, I'll have another go. Sukihis partner, is that better? That's nice. Very good. Okay. Okay, well, I can't, and I'm, I'm interested, maybe some other time offline, but uh, I'm interested, you made a comment about, about getting agreement in Norway takes longer, so maybe, maybe that's something about the Norwegian psyche that I never have realized before, but uh, I've made a, made a mental note about that one. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Jan, and thank you, everyone, um, for attending today. That, that brings us to the end of our sessions.